Heidelberg Catechism that helps us understand how God provides. It says this, God will provide whatever I need for body and soul and will turn to my good whatever adversity he sends me in this sad world. He's able to do this because he's Almighty God. He desires to do this because he's a faithful father. All things, in fact, come to us not by chance, but from his fatherly hand. God is our provider. And God's provision is not merely stuff. It's not just food. It's not just clothing. It's not just our homes. God provides love, beauty, hope. He provides delight, security, significance the deep desires of our hearts. It's not just stuff. God provides the deep desires of our hearts. He provides all that we need. But we struggle with that. I mean, it sounds like a good deal, right? God provides everything that we need. But we struggle with receiving that. We struggle with trusting God to provide all that we need. Because we got to pack the suitcase. We've got to load it with the stuff that we need. And so we struggle with that. And that's why it's so important, the context, this passage, and the context of this passage is so important because Israel struggled with that issue. Israel struggled with who was going to be their provider. That's really the story of Israel. And so we need to understand some history. And so a quick run through some history. So, uh, Israel was the, were the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, who were the covenant people of God, brought out of Egypt into the promised land. They were given the tabernacle, the law of God, uh, the priesthood, eventually a temple. They were to be a people who would worship the Lord and follow the Lord alone. That was who they were. Saul was the first king of Israel. Saul didn't follow the Lord faithfully, and so the prophet Samuel anointed David to be the next king of Israel. David was made king of Judah after Saul's death. David was made king of Judah while the house of Saul ruled in in Israel in the north. Eventually, though, David was made king over all Israel and, and Israel was united together. It stayed united through the reign of Solomon, David's son. But in Solomon's son, Rehoboam, He could not hold it together, and so it split. And so you have Israel in the north ruled over by a guy named Jeroboam, and uh, and then Judah and Benjamin in the south ruled over by Solomon's son Rehoboam. Now, the northern kingdom had a problem, um, and that problem was worship. (laughs) That problem was was that, uh, here, I get to use a laser pointer, (laughs) hooray. So, um, Northern Kingdom, Southern Kingdom, and there's a place here called Jerusalem. That's where the temple was. That's where they were to worship. Except uh, now Jeroboam's people up here, if they were going to worship, they had to come down into Rehoboam's territory, and Jeroboam said, well, that's not going to fly. And so he had a great idea. It wasn't actually great. He thought it was great. He decided to make two shrines. He made a shrine in the north up here in a city called Dan and one down here in Bethel so that it was equidistant, it was on the borders, and people wouldn't have to leave Israel to worship the Lord. Only the problem was is that he didn't have them worship the Lord. He set up two golden calves in those places, and he had the audacity to say, here are your gods, Israel, who brought you out of Egypt. And so this was a great evil, and it turned the people of Israel uh, from following the Lord faithfully. Now, eventually, the northern kingdom was ruled over by the Omri dynasty. Omri wasn't a very good king. His son Ahab was even worse. And Ahab continued the sin of these golden calves, but then he added the worship of Baal to it. So a foreign god brought in, who his wife Jezebel from Phoenicia uh, had, had brought in. And so Israel fell into idolatry. That is what destroyed them in the, excuse me, in the end. And interestingly, idolatry is ultimately about provision. Idolatry is ultimately about provision. Who will provide? Who's going to provide? An invisible God who can only be worshipped in Jerusalem, which isn't even in my country, 
and I can't see, and there's priesthood, and I can't even get into his presence, or will I trust Baal, who he's got statues everywhere and shrines everywhere, and it's easy to worship him, it's easy to see him. Who am I going to trust? Baal was considered the storm god. He was the god of rain and dew, and therefore he was the god of fertility. And so they would trust Baal for their crops and for their children. And in worshiping Baal, Israel is looking to another god, to other gods to provide for them. Now, one thing, this is, I'm going off track here a little bit, but you've got to understand this about idolatry. We think of idolatry as this, that Israel worshiped the Lord. Yay! And then all of a sudden, a king comes in and says, you should worship Baal. And they're like, yeah, we're going to do that. So they throw out the Lord, and they're faithful to Baal. That's not how it worked, ever, in Israel. What they struggled with was something called syncretism. Yahweh, the Lord, remained their main god. It's just they added all these other little gods to them. So when they were going to go to war with the Philistines, well then, the Lord, he is our God, and he's the national God. But when I want my, you know, my ingrown toenail to be healed, well then I, I go to this God over here. I go to Baal or whoever. When I need my crops to go, and I go to Baal. And so it was syncretism that led them astray. And sadly, syncretism still happens even today where we worship the Lord, but we add a little of this and we add a little of that. And so the Lord sent his prophet, Elijah, to stand against the evil of Ahab and the syncretism of his people and to call his people back to himself. And so the first thing we see Elijah do is to confront Ahab. That's the first time we meet Elijah. And actually, the greater confrontation, uh, confront, confrontation confrontation was not with Ahab per se, but Elijah was taking on Baal. He was challenging this God, Baal. And so uh, he says this, as the Lord, the God of Israel lives, whom I serve, there will be neither dew nor rain in the next few years except at my word. And so notice that Elijah proclaims the Lord, Yahweh, as as God, not Baal. Baal is not the God of Israel. The Lord is the God of Israel, according to Elijah. As opposed to Ahab, Elijah serves the Lord. He says, the, according to the, the Lord, whom I serve, and whom you're not serving, Ahab, they're set in opposition. And then Elijah declares that it's the Lord, not Baal, who controls the rain. There's going to be no rain for the next few years, except for my word, a prophet of the Lord God of Israel. And so in this confrontation, Elijah presents the Lord as the only God. We're going to see this confrontation kicked up a notch next week when he actually challenges the prophets of Baal. But Ahab must have understood this challenge. He must have seen this challenge to his newly acquired God. Ahab was trusting in Baal, to, uh, to provide rain and fertile crops. And yet he had just been told, none of that's going to happen. You're not going to have any rain for years <laughs> apart from the word of the Lord, apart from the word of the prophet of the Lord. Ahab was told that the God he was trusting in to provide could not provide. Now, evidently, Ahab didn't appreciate that, <laughs> as you can imagine. And that's uh, made apparent by Elijah having to hide himself. In fact, it's the Lord who tells Elijah, go and hide yourself in the Kareth Ravine east of the Jordan. And the Lord provides for Elijah there. He's able to drink from the brook that is there. And then God sends ravens to bring food to Elijah. You know what that is? Water and food? Provision. God is providing for Elijah. Baal could not provide. But the Lord provided for Elijah. The God of Israel not only controls the rain, but he also controls creatures. Now some commentators, some people who write about these passages, are, are doing like just back bends and, and contortions trying to explain away the ravens. But why? I mean, God is the God of the universe. He made the birds. He made ravens. If he wants to tell them, go take food to that guy, they can do it. They're going to do it. 
And so I, I think it's wonderful that, that God who controls the rain, controls the creature, they're both controlled by the Lord, and he uses both to provide for Elijah. He is the, nothing is too hard for him. The Lord provides, and he provides abundantly. We take that for granted. We're like, oh, bread and meat in the morning and bread and meat in the evening? Man, he's not doing very well. Well, in that day and age, meat was, was a luxury item. You didn't have meat every day, all the time, on everything that you eat. It was a luxury, because you owned those animals, and if you killed them, they were gone. <laughs> and so it was a luxury, and yet the Lord brings Elijah meat and bread every morning and every evening, lavish provision for him. He was given these things. But Elijah event couldn't stay there forever. We read that sometime later the, the brook did dry up because there had been no rain on the land. But the Lord still provided for Elijah. He sent him to Sidon, of all places, to Phoenicia, where Jezebel came from, where Baal was worshipped. He sent him right into the heart of, of, of the enemy, per se, to a place called Zarephath, to a widow there. Jesus would mention this story in mentioning uh, how he would not do any miraculous signs in Nazareth and how he was uh, 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 hinting at the kingdom of God expanding to the Gentile peoples, that, that the miracles weren't just for Israel, but for, there for all the world. And he references this passage about this w widow who the Lord sent Elijah to. And Elijah arrived there and found the widow as soon as he arrived. She was gathering sticks. And Elijah asked her for some water and then called after her, oh yeah, and some bread too. And it's at that moment we find out her condition, her circumstances, and how desperate they were. She had no bread, only a handful of flour and a little bit of oil. She was collecting the sticks to make one final meal, and then she and her, her, her son just expected to starve to death. And Elijah replied with these words. He said to her, don't be afraid, go home. And do as you have said. But first, <laughs> at first when you read it, you're kind of like, man, Elijah, that's kind of mean. She just said, I'm, I'm starving, I'm going to die. I've only got a little bit of, of, of flour and oil. And he's like, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. But make me, make me a loaf of bread first. And then you can have whatever's left. You're like, Elijah, come on. But then he says, the word of the Lord, he says, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. The jar of flour will not be used up provision. The jar of flour will not be used up. The jug of oil will not run dry until the, the day the Lord sends rain on the land. Go and do this in faith. And so the woman had a, de a decision to make, a choice to make, to trust this strange man and this God of Israel, another nation, and divide her already meager final supper or to keep it for herself and her son. She had a choice to make, and her choice showed great faith. She went away and did as Elijah told her, and the Lord provided. The Lord provided. She went away, did as Elijah told her, so there was food every day for Elijah and for the woman and her family, for the jar of flour was not used up, and the jug of oil did not run dry, in keeping with the word of the Lord, spoken by Elijah. A miracle, yes, but it's God's provision, the good provision of a faithful and good God. But as often happens, <laughs> our faith is put to the test. She showed great faith in that decision, and yet her faith was put to the test. We read in, in verses 17 through 18, Sometime later, the son of the woman who owned the house became ill. She, he grew worse and worse and finally stopped breathing. She said to Elijah, what do, you have, what do you have against me, man of God? Did you come here to remind me of my sin and kill my son? The widow's son evidently died, and the woman was now questioning her faith and her trust in Elijah. And notice that guilt and shame come out in this desperate situation. We don't know the story behind it, but she says, have you, why are you doing this? Why is God doing this? Are you, have you come to show, remind me of my sin? And that's why you're killing my son? We don't know the backstory, But we know that she wondered if she was being punished. And sometimes when things like that happen, we wonder, God, are you punishing me? Is that what you're doing? But Elijah took the boy and prayed for him. 
And people wonder about how Elijah prayed for him. It seems kind of strange. He, he cried out to the Lord, Oh Lord, my God, let this boy's life return to him. And perhaps Elijah was instructed to do so as he, as he lays on the boy and, and, and prays for him. Lord, let the, his life return to him. Maybe that's what the Lord told him to do because in the beginning we, we read that Elijah didn't know what to do. He took this dead boy up and he said, Oh Lord, my God, have you brought tragedy upon this widow that I'm staying with? Causing her son to die? So exactly what she said, he took it and he said it to the Lord. Is this what you're doing, Lord? It seems like the Lord said, No. <laughs> Place yourself on that boy and cry out to me. And how whatever means, whatever, whatever Elijah prayed that way, the Lord heard Elijah's cry. And the boy's life returned to him. We read, the Lord heard his cry, life returned to the boy. Elijah picked him up, carried him down from the room, gave him to his mother and said, look, look, your son is alive. And then she said, now I know that you are a man of God and that the word of the Lord from your mouth is the truth. The Lord provides. That's the message of this passage. The Lord provides. That is the message of this story. Not Baal, not anything else. The Lord is the one who provides. Even in the midst of, of, of apparent death, the Lord provides. Even in the midst of famine, the Lord provides. Even in the midst of opposition, being hunted, the Lord provides security and, and shelter. The Lord provides. It's a central theme. And so it's quite relevant to people like us because the core concern of every human being is that question of who is my provider? Who's going to provide for me? We get things so easily that sometimes we don't even ask that question. We just assume that we're going to get these things. But ultimately, deep down, we still struggle with that question. Who is going to provide? Who is my provider? Is it me? <laughs> someone else? It's at the heart. That question is at the heart of every human being. And as we engage that question, Elijah does two things. He confronts us and he encourages us. So hear both. Not just the confrontation, but, but the encouragement as well. Elijah confronts our easy fear. He confronts our easy fear because we become afraid easily. God provides again and again and again, and yet we still become afraid. W will he provide? Will, will this happen? On Sunday morning, we sing the song, Jehovah Jireh. I don't think we've sung that, but um, I remember growing up. I think, it was, I think it came out the year I was born, but I remember it back in the 80s at least. It, that was a really popular song, like Jehovah Jireh. He's my provider. I, I don't know. Anyway, my mom would sing it. So uh, that's, I always picture my mom singing that song when I, when I think of it. But Jehovah Jireh means the Lord provider. The Lord is our provider. And so on Sunday mornings, we sing this song, the Lord is my provider. Hallelujah. And then on Monday, we're, we're freaking out. Why? Because we, be, we become fearful so easily. And Elijah confronts us on our easy fear. And he confronts us on our lack of trust. Yes, we know Bible passages. Yes, we've probably heard the story about Elijah before. But will God provide for me? Will God provide for, for me in this situation? Will God provide for my, for my children? My grandchildren? Will, will, will God actually show up? I had a friend recently he was talking with his son, and, and, and he, was, he, was, he was almost scared to tell his son to, like, just ask Jesus to show up and to, to show himself to you. Why? Because what if he doesn't? <laughs> so we, we, we know the promise of if you ask, if you seek, if you knock, the door will be open. I will be there. I'm going to do it. We know those promises, but we don't trust him. Will he show up? Maybe he's probably not going to show up. Elijah, or Elijah shows this lack of trust in us that when we despair, when we give in to discouragement and defeat, it's a lack of trust. When we say, I, I don't think he's going to provide, and so I better do it. 
It's a lack of trust. And so he confronts us finally on our grasping response to situations, our control reaction. When we take matters into our own hands, that's what idolatry is. Taking matters into your own hands. I don't know if God's going to provide, but I got this nifty little statue here, and maybe, maybe, just maybe, if I can hold it and I can control it, then I'll be provided for. That's idolatry. When we want to control our a- outcomes, and it's this grasping response of, I got to provide for myself, and I got to hold on to this stuff. And all of a sudden, grace is offered to us. Grace is handed to us. And all we got to do is just take this free gift of grace. But we can't take the free gift of grace. Why? Because our hands are full. (laughs) Because we're grasping so tightly to our own provision that we can't even receive grace because grace requires empty, open hands. And our grasping, controlling response keeps us from grace. Elijah challenges us in this. He confronts us in this because these things are idolatry. All these things are idolatry. We may not have little statues at home. We may not have a shrine that we visit, but we've got idols. Money, power, pleasure. We turn to these things to provide for us to give us the security and the significance that we long for so desperately. Idolatry is about provision. And idolatry is looking at anything else, anything other than our creator and our sustainer and our redeemer to satisfy the deep desires of our hearts. Idolatry is looking to anything else other than the Lord to satisfy the deep longing of our heart. And Elijah confronts our propensity to idolatry. He calls us away from it to the ultimate provider. Who is the ultimate provider? Elijah tells us unequivocally, the Lord, God of Israel, is our provider. And so Elijah encourages us. He encourages you today through his story. He he encourages you with raven's wings to remember how the Lord provided, that God provided shelter and safety and food for the waiting out of nowhere. He just had birds show up and provide for Elijah. Do you not think that the God who did that for Elijah can do that for you? Well, that was Elijah. So what? Hebrews 11 tells us all these people saw all this stuff, but but they only receive all the goodness when, when we're when we are brought into it. We're in this together. Elijah received grace from God just as we received grace from God. The God who helped Elijah promises to help you. And so Elijah's raven's wings can be an encouragement to you as well that the Lord out of nowhere just provides and blesses. Elijah encourages us with the jar of flour and the jug of oil that God's resources don't run out. Oh, I can't pray, for, I can't pray for, for this situation. Yes, I'm going in for major surgery this week, but I can't pray for this because there's people starving in Africa. I can't pray for that because my neighbor's got more stuff going on than I do. My stuff's not important. I don't have to pray for that. I don't have to ask people to pray for me because there's all, all sorts of other stuff going on in the world. Are you serious? I, I'm getting on you because I, I, I know this happens. I know people do this, and I, I've done it myself. Do you really think God is that shorthanded? Do you really think that God, oh, oh I'm sorry, I'd love to help you out, but I've got to help this other person over here. I've I got, I got, you know, this whole nation going on, you know, stuff going on, a civil war over here. I, I'm just, I'm strapped. I, I can't, there's no way I could possibly help you. I, I, I'm sorry. He's the God of the universe. He's the God of, of, of sovereignty and power and abundance. He is infinite. He is eternal. There is no beginning, no end. He never runs out. Why did this never run out? Because God never runs out. It wasn't a magical jar. It was the Lord who blessed and kept blessing. And so his goodness never fails. It's new every morning. Great is his faithfulness. And so be encouraged by the jug of oil and the jar of flour because God provides abundantly. Ask for it. Ask for help because he's not limited. He's not going to run out. He's not going to run out. 
and be encouraged with life being restored out of death. That the Lord not only controls creatures and rain, but he gives life. He sustains life. He brings us back to life. He calls those things which are not as though they were. He gives life to the dead. Be encouraged by that. And be encouraged that basically that he brings you back to life. That's your story. That's our story. For Christians, that's our story. We were dead. In Christ, we were made alive. That's your story. You were dead, and now you're alive. Be encouraged that you have a God who does that. And not just, you know, at one moment in time. Every day when you trust him, he gives you life. He brings you back. And finally, be encouraged by the word of the Lord, by the promises of God. The widow said, now I know that the word of the Lord is true. We are given that confidence as well. The promises of God are good. His word is our life. It is our strength because his promises are our provision. God's promises are our provision. And so, my friends, who is your provider? I encourage you, as I encourage myself, to let go of the idols that are in your life, that are all around you, that clamor for your attention, and choose the Lord, because with the Lord is surpassing provision. With the Lord are promises that are true. With the Lord is life, even in the midst of death. With him is flour that is never used up, and oil that never runs dry. With him are resources that will never run out, because it's him in you working in you. And so, brothers and sisters, trust him. Trust the Lord to be your provider. Don't make a t-shirt out of that. Don't make a bumper sticker out of that. Don't log that away. Actively, this afternoon, trust the Lord. This week, when you get that call or you get that letter, and you're like, ah, choose to trust the Lord. Choose to say, no, <laughs> To everything else, you are my provider. You will provide. Will you do that? <laughs> well, we try to do that. All right, four people are going to do that this week. Praise the Lord. Let's pray. <laughs> I'll phrase it this way. Can I get an amen? amen? Lord, you've heard our amen. That means so be it. It doesn't mean hang up the phone or the end. It means so be it. Let this be so. And we've just said that. We just ended this message by saying, let it be so. We just ended that challenge of, I'm going to trust you with, yes, let it be so. And so, Lord, let it be so in us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.